day that the kids and the wives can um, have fun uh, enjoying their husbands and fathers. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us today as we continue to walk through the Gospel of John. Open the eyes of our heart. Help us to see the glory of Jesus. Hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Gospel of John. Spent a lot of time on... Well, we'll just keep reading. It's, it's such a... I mean, the, the prologue of the Gospel of John is one of the most important, profound, foundational passages in Scripture. It, it really is. Uh, there's, just, there's just so much to it. I'll read in the LEB first, and we can look at it, because again, it's a little bit different from the NIV, and often when we read it in a different translation, different things jump out at us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. So we, we talked a lot about 1 through 3 last week, so we'll go 4 on, because otherwise we never get through anything. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. A man sent from God, whose name was John. This one came for a witness, in order that he could testify about the light, so that all would believe through him. The one was not the light, but came in order that he could testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to every person, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. And the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, he came to his own things, and his own people did not receive him. But as many as received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them authority to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a husband, but of God. And the word became flesh and took up residence among us. And we saw his glory, glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This one, um, this one was he about whom I said, The one who comes after me is ahead of me, because he existed before me. For from this fullness we have all received, and grace after grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time except the one and only God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father. That one was made him known. We're going to talk about light and darkness today. You'll notice that there... It's kind of nice we started with... The second epistle of John, the third epistle of John, the first epistle of John, and now this. This was, this was the recommendation in the commentary by I. Howard Marshall. Because it gets us ready to think about how John talks. And you'll notice that there's a lot of repetition in the prologue here. And there are certain themes that come up again and again. He brings it up. And then he brings it up a little later, and he weaves them all through. I was, I was, I was listening to, you know, I listen to all kinds of crazy things these days, but I was listening to, there's a... I'm sorry, I've been on YouTube too much. I know, there's lots of crazy stuff on there. I gotta remember to send Paula an email, because I need to ask him about it. Oh boy. So, okay. so, so one of the things there's a so one of the really interesting things going on in the church world is the is the rise of the Orthodox Church in America, 
Now, a little bit of church history. So, if this is the Mediterranean, of course, Italy went into it, and Rome was there. Well, well the Mediterranean, in some ways, was the, was the highway system for the Roman Empire. And if you look at the map of the Roman Empire, it basically circled the Mediterranean, went up into England and into France, and, but, but that was the Roman Empire, and it makes sense because in the ancient world, you could transport and travel so much more easily over water because water can carry weight far more easily. And if you're actually having to do roads, and the Romans did great roads too, um, that's, you know, information and communication and moving things is key to a successful empire, and that's what Rome had. Now, the Roman Empire, you know, Rome was over here, and Latin was the language of the West, and Greek was the language of the East. And if you remember, we've talked, we've talked a bit about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great established the, his empire in the East, and the Greek was the language of the empire in the East. Alexander died a young man, and his generals carved up his empire. But in the sermon I'm going to talk about, Cyrus the Great in Persia, so Aramaic was the language of the Persian Empire. When the Greek Empire destroyed the Persian Empire, Greek became another language overlay. So when you look at the time when Jesus lived in Palestine, you had Hebrew, which was the language of the Jews. You had Aramaic, which was the language of the Persian Empire and still commonly spoken, so it was probably the, the more common language used by Jesus and his time. And the Gospel of John, huge debate as to whether or not the Gospel of John was first written in Aramaic. Sometimes when you read the Gospel of John, it sounds, there's, there's Semitisms in it, in the language. And it, it, and for that reason, some scholars wonder, was it written in another language then translated into Greek? Or maybe the person who wrote it or perhaps spoke it, because it could be that, oh gosh, there's so much to get into. Could be that the person, that the, what these gospels are, are really, as the tradition says, re basically people writing down and stylizing and editing the sermons of the apostles. And so Mark was considered the, the preaching of Peter. And so these could be the sermons of John. And so Hebrew was the, was the language of the Jews. Aramaic was the language of the region. And Greek was the language of the Eastern Roman Empire. Okay? Latin was the language of the Western Roman Empire. Now, someone like the Apostle Paul probably spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and maybe even Latin. Could be, I don't know. But so, so you've got all of this. Well, what happens a thousand years into the history of the church is that there's a theological fight over <laughs> How the, how the Holy Spirit proceeds, and it, it, it kind of capped off a lot of struggle, and, and the church was divided between the eastern and western parts of the church. This followed a division that had happened before where Constantine established a new capital in the east called Constantinople. And also um, today is Istanbul, you know, it's, it's right there in Turkey. And the Eastern Roman Empire was better educated, wealthier, um, more developed than the Western Empire that spoke, that spoke Latin. So eventually when the church split, so the Pope excommunicated the patriarchs, and the patriarchs excommunicated the Pope, and you know, all of this happened at about 1000 AD, and there is a division in the world, pretty much. Well, well much, of, 
And, and then for many years, then, the, is, is, then Islam grew and swallowed much of the East and North Africa, all the way up into Spain. So that, that then became the Islamic world, and the Western world was pretty much set to develop on its own. And so you have the Roman Catholic Church, and eventually the Protestant Reformation. So many of us, and then you have the colonial period where what was Western Christianity then spread out all over the world in the age of discovery in the colonial period. And so for, for much of, for many of us, we have only really known Christianity in the West. Well, Christianity survived in the East. You have the Greek Orthodox Church. You have the Russian Orthodox Church. You have Orthodox churches that sort of remained in the world that was overrun by Islam. Well, after the Cold War, there's been a lot of immigration from the Greek Orthodox Church. They came over, you know, World War II was very tough on this part of the world. And so after World War II, a lot of Greeks came over. Um, since the fall of the Cold War, since the fall of the, the Soviet bloc, more, other, more from the Eastern Church has come over, and so the Orthodox Church is, in a sense, a very old church, but also a very new church to America, because they haven't been part of the Christian conversations in the West very much, and they have their own theological traditions. Their, they, their emphasis on church fathers tends to be more the Eastern Church fathers, whereas the West tends to emphasize Augustine, who was in North Africa at the end of the, um, towards the end of the Roman Empire, of the Western Empire. So, you know, you have these two traditions. So, back to YouTube. I found somebody in, because people are always recommending me YouTubes to watch now, sent me a video from a, an Orthodox church in Kansas. And, the Orthodox Church in Kansas, it's pretty clear that the, the priest of the Orthodox Church in Kansas used to be a Protestant, and he's from Kansas because he talks like that, and he was, he's doing a course on the Gospel of John. And these people go as long as we do on a Gospel. Um, and, 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 he, and so what, part of what the Orthodox Church is bringing into the conversation is some of their traditions. So, for example, I didn't know a lot about how they organized their liturgical calendar, which they have a liturgical calendar, which is slightly different from the West, and we recognize this when holidays come up and the Western Christmas is a little different from the Eastern Christmas, and the Western Easter is a little different from the Eastern Pasqua, which is their Easter. Well, one of the things that he talked about is that in their church tradition, they would use the Gospel of Mark for catechesis. Anybody know what catechesis is? Catechism. Catechism. What do what do what does the Christian Reformed Church have for catechism? The Heidelberg Catechism. And so the Heidelberg Catechism is is the way that the Christian Reformed Church says, well, this is what it means to be a Christian in the Christian Reformed Church. You learn the Heidelberg Catechism. Well, in the Eastern tradition, you learn the Gospel of Mark. And the reason, the reason is, by the tradition, they say that the Gospel of Mark was used for catechesis. And what's interesting to me is then the Gospel of John, so what happens is that the Gospel of Mark starts with a baptism. Notice that the Gospel of John also starts with a baptism. And that fits in with their liturgical calendar. And then once, once the person is baptized and formally accepted and joined into the church, then they study the Gospel of John. And what was really interesting to me was he said that the Gospel of John is mystagogy. Oh, we hear that, we think, oh, what is that? Well, mystery. mystery. Yeah, you picked it up. Um, pedagogy is, is pedo. 
is a child. Pedagogy is teaching a child. Mystagogy is teaching the mystery of Christ. But it's not just teaching, it's entering into. And their, their claim is that just as the Gospel of Mark is catechesis from Peter, the Gospel of Mark is the record of Peter's teaching, the Gospel of John is the record of John's teaching. I thought, and I, I'd never heard that in the West. And so it's just very interesting hearing these, hearing these different traditions. Now, part of what's, what's quite interesting too to me is that it's often the case that, so you have these, in the, in the middle of the 20th century, these evangelistic crusades were very popular. And so Billy Graham would go out and he'd fill a stadium and he'd preach. And after he'd preach, people would come forward. But after people come forward, you have then the question, well, what do we do with these people? They want to become Christians. How do we teach them what the Christian faith is? Often, what would be given to people would be the Gospel of John. And I thought that was very interesting. And, and this gets into this, this question of, of how we learn. And I've been working through a lot of this stuff as thinking through all the kind of crazy things I think about lately. Um, part, of, part of it gets into thought and language. Are, we use language today culturally in a very pragmatic way to learn things like facts. That's very big in our culture. If you go to a church like the Orthodox Church, they have a lot of liturgy, and the liturgy is usually basically the Bible kind of put together liturgically. When we recite a psalm in our Sunday morning service, which we usually do, that's in a sense liturgy. And, and when you recite a psalm, or you pray a psalm, or you're having devotions and you're reading a psalm in the morning, you're usually not reading the psalm for new information. In fact, maybe you've read the Bible before, maybe you've read the Bible ten times before. So then why are you reading the psalm again? In fact, if maybe you have a habit of reading, going through the psalms once a year, or reading the whole Bible once a year, you'd have to say, well, why do you read the psalms again and again and again? Well, for that matter, why do you sing psalms again and again and again? Why? Anybody know? Praise. You enjoy them. Well, that's a funny thing. After you've read it once, why would you enjoy it again? What happens when you read? Lots of things you can Praise. That was fun. Comfort. Okay, that was fun. Praise. What did you say? Comfort. Comfort. And, and so this, so, so one of the ways that we use language is we, we look for information. Even that word. <laughs> in for formation. It forms you. Hmm. It informs you. Hmm. Well, when you're using language and you're driving down I-5 and you see a big giant green thing on top of the overpass, why are you reading? Informa for information. For information. You want to find out where does this highway go? Do I need to get off this exit? Do I need to make that turn? That's one kind of reading. It's a very different reading when you're sitting down reading the Psalms. A Psalm that you might have read. Maybe it's the 23rd Psalm. A Psalm that you've memorized. Or Psalm 100. Or, or some other passage of the Bible. Or maybe even this. Some of, many of you have read this passage many times. One of the things you're looking for from this Sunday School class is information. You're looking for something new that I might be able to give you. So that's one way that language works. But another way that language works is comfort, as Corinne said. A reminder. A reminder. I was going to say confirmation. <laughs> confirmation. Um, well, even that word. So information.
In form. What is form? Organizing chaos. Organizing chaos. Go ahead, Marty. No. You, you used your hands, didn't you? Yes. 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 Isn't it funny how Put it together. instead of words, our hands, I can almost say it better. What is form? Form is, see, paper doesn't quite do it because paper is a little two dimensional. Contains. Contains. It's the shape of something. Now, you used a word. Conform or confirm. What's the difference? Now, con, anybody know where the prefix con comes from? With. With. And Greek. With. With form. With confirmation. Now, how is conformation and confirmation different? One, you can change. The other is, to, is solidified. Okay. Go ahead, Lil. I was going to say, uh, you confirm the information that you have received. Okay. So firm is, form is, <laughs> and so firming is firming it up. Form is putting it together. What does Paul say in Romans 12 about conform? But be transformed. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> Tran. What is transform? Change. Change. New form. New form. Changing form. See, and it's amazing everything that's just embedded into language. It's it's thousands and thousands of years of history across different languages. We're all speaking English, but there's Greek and there's Latin. I mean, all of that is built into this stuff. And we don't even know it, but we use it. Isn't that interesting? So, the Gospel of John is part of changing us. It's part of transformation. We want to be conformed to the Gospel of John. Wow. So let's, so let's get into, let's, let's start at verse 4. In him was life. Now if you remember from the epistle of John, this word came up a lot in the epistle of John. It's one of John's favorite words. We're always talking about life. And we're often connecting it to this next word. In him was life. And the life, now isn't that interesting? And the life, well then you begin to ask, well, what life? Well, the life was the light of humanity, of, in the NIV, all mankind. If you look at the NLT, the word, now again, notice, in a paraphrase, they just, it's very different from a translation because you can just drop any old word you want to in there. So the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. And see, this is why the people will sometimes say, well, why isn't the New Living Translation an authorized version of the Bible for worship by the Christian Reformed Church? Well, verse 4 is a reason for that. And the Christian Reformed Church doesn't say, well, don't buy it and don't read it. It's just that what you're reading is more like a devotional than a translation. And you can tell because if you look at the LEB and the NIV, well, they pretty much say the same thing. And you look at the NLT and, well, they've, they've just given you a nice little thought. It's a lovely thought, but it's not a translation of the Greek. So in him was life. Well, who's him? Jesus. <laughs> See, part of the problem here, well, Jesus, God. But we want to get more specific. So Logos, the word, the word 
And the word is a him. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. Now, again, just like, I, just like the point I made with all these words, you all understand this at a certain level. But I want to do is push you to another level in terms of, okay, can we, can we get more specific? Can we, can we tell little stories that illustrate what this verse says? So in him, and him is the word, well, it, he's God and Jesus. Now, why would we use four different words that point to the same? I don't want to use the word thing, because in a sense, God isn't a thing. Keep us flexible. Keep us flexible. <laughs> why, why four different words? Now, all of them, all of them have their role that they play in this verse, him is the only one that's actually in it. Are you describing who, who him was? Yes! <laughs> who him was, that's right, Will. One word isn't able to contain all of it. Okay. Because God, well, what is the difference? Again, when you talk this way, you got to be really careful. Why would sometimes you use God and sometimes you'd use Jesus and sometimes you'd use word? It depends on who you're talking to. Okay. And why would that make a difference? Well, because we're all at different spaces, places in learning okay. what this is all about. Okay. Each word has its specific use. Yes. And, and, and points to its specific aspect. And so Jesus is, is probably the easiest of the bunch. Why? We know him. We know him. <laughs> now, how do you say we know him, Marty? Well, he actually walked on the earth. He was a person like us. And so we can perhaps identify more easily than we can identify with a, a spirit. Okay. Okay. So, so because of the incarnation... We, you know, even though there's tremendous mystery in connecting Jesus and God, I mean, we, we don't appreciate just what, a, what an absolute mind-blowing idea it was to connect these two things without diminishing this. You see, as, as I've made the point before, Alexander the Great, from a pagan perspective, could easily be called the son of God, even though everybody knew he was the son of Minna, Philip of Macedonia. Because they used the word God differently. But these are a bunch of Jews running around. And they wouldn't use the word God like that. In fact, in Jesus' trial, they, they, they cornered Jesus into accepting the title son of God and all right well that's you know open and shut case now in terms of death blasphemy, blasphemy. well well why did the Jews have why why were the Jews why they have this, this peculiar idea about this word God what what was different for them about this world, this word, than their neighbors. He was holy and unapproachable, not to be holy looked at or touched. Right. And he was not just holy, he was what? Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> As we talked about in last week's sermon. He's holy, holy, holy. And not approachable. Not to be touched. In fact, you even had to be careful about his name. You had to be so careful about his name. Today, Jews continue to write G. 
dash D. And to not say God. And last week we talked about Adonai as Lord and why they'd use Lord as a circumlocution for God because they were going to be very, very careful not to say his name in vain because they took, they took him just that seriously. And then a bunch of Jews start worshiping a man and call him God and people today can't figure out why the early Jews and Christians had so much conflict. Of course they had conflict. The Apostle Paul is running around synagogues in the Eastern Roman world saying Jesus is risen from the dead and Jesus is God. Yeah, they're going to have conflict. Yeah, they're going to take him outside and stone him. Yeah, there's going to be a riot. Now, here we have, in him was the life. Okay, notice, why would there be a definite article in front of, see if we'd say, in him was life, that's a little different from, in him was the life. What's the difference between those two sentences? It's, not, this one is important. it's not just any life. It's not just any life. Specific life. This one is important. We're, we're separating this one out. Well, that's holy, right? We're separating it out. That's what holiness means. Holiness means separation. Is, one, is one an adjective and the other is a noun? Well, it's, this, is the, this is the definite article. If it said, in him was a life, that would mean something different to us. In him was life, that would mean something different. And in him was the life means a different thing again. It, it, it sets it apart. It elevates it. It's saying, you know, if let's say you go on vacation and you're on a beach, if you like these kinds of things, or if you're on a cruise, or if you're in a lovely hotel room, or if you're sitting down in front of a great deal, you might sit back and say, ah, this is the life. It's a phrase we use in English. We get that phrase probably from here. This is the life. When, when you sit down on vacation and say, ah, this is the life, what do you mean? Full and complete. Full and complete. There's a hierarchy there. And you're saying, this life is at the top of the hierarchy. This is, I, I, I work my job, I struggle to do all of these kind of things, and this one moment right now feels like fulfillment, consummation, kingdom come, even if it's just a nice meal, or a lovely day at the beach, or, you know, a, uh, maybe it's Christmas and all the family is home. Maybe it's graduation day. It's all these moments that you say, this is the life. Now, John says, in him was life and the life. So, in fact, he uses it twice. And how does that change it? In him was life and the life. If you say it without the definite article, it's bigger. In him was life. The obvious, the obvious contrast to life would be what? Death. Death. And the life, well now you just put it at the top of a hierarchy. In other words, John is using this language and and See, it's kind of funny because we have our little conscious self and we're watching. John is using this language in a sense. He's bypassing because you don't notice unless I stop and make you notice. You don't notice the way he's using language. But he's using language to elevate Jesus here. 
And that's why he's using Logos, Word, and God, and Jesus. He's using this language to, in a sense, get in behind your defenses and impact your brain in some subtle and special ways. Advertising does this all the time. When you turn on the TV, why is everyone on TV so extraordinarily young and beautiful? Keeps our attention. Keeps our attention. They're getting in behind. Now, if I point it out, part of us says, ah, I know what they're doing, but it's still having an effect. And the advertisers know this. How do they know it? Sales. Sales. They see it measured. They say, it's so funny because I, I was going into, I was into, I won't mention the store because I won't give them any free advertising on YouTube. Uh, I was in a store and I noticed that they had a bunch of, you know, now it's a big thing that, oh, we have body image and all of the models are skinny, blah, 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 blah. So some stores are now using larger models. But number one, they're still very attractive people. <laughs> they're not ordinary people. And, and then I thought, but what's, real, what's really funny is if they use just regular people wearing their clothes, you know what? The clothes don't look as good because the clothes always look better on the beautiful people. And, and so, you know, these stores are kind of tinkering with this. And, and the fact that the, the fact that the store is using larger models, well, this is just another means of hiking up the, ooh, this is a more moral store than the store that's only using skinny models. It's all still commercial competition, but it still impacts us. Not to mention the lighting, the photographer, the makeup. <laughs> exactly. They're not dumb. They're going to make it look good. Expensive clothes. Expensive clothes, that's right. Good get me they say one size fit all. <laughs> That's right. Is something gonna fit Lily and something gonna fit me? I don't think so. <laughs> so so in him was life, not death. Remember Gospel of John always dealt or the the the, the Epistle of John always dealt in these black and white contrasts. Death and life. And the life was the light of humanity. Okay. Along with the uh, NIV said that life was the light of all mankind. Yeah. Between that and God. Yeah. Well, I, the NIV is doing that. Ba basically, the, um, the Greek has the definite article. And you can see it at the end. If you look at verse 4, chi, hey, that, that, that letter at the end, that's hey. It's got a hard breathing mark, so it's, there's a And that's the definite article. Hey, Zoe. That's hey, Zoe. There it is. The life is and um, So the NIV wanted, wanted to accentuate it by turning it into that. It's, it's a move. Um, this is what translating committees and editors do. They, they, and the NIV try, the reason I lay these three out the way I do is that the LEV is fairly literalistic. The NIV uses what they call, <laughs> it was very controversial when they started using them, what they call dynamic equivalences, which means well, we're going to do a translation, but we're going to take a few little paraphrasy moves in our translation. And some people really didn't like that. And then the NLT is full-blown paraphrase. So that's why I lay them out like this. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. And that life was the light of all mankind. And I think the NLT is just a mess, so I'm not going to read that. Um, what does that mean for it to be the light of all humanity? Give me some other words to illustrate that idea. It's the light of the world. Okay. 
And where do we get that line from? John. John. <laughs> Jesus. I am the light of the world. And when we get there, we'll have to talk about... We'll, by that point, we'll, we will have already talked about all the I am's. I am, I am, I am. Question again. What is... Give me some other words that... Give me a little story that illustrates what John is meaning by... And the life was the light of humanity. How about truth? Truth, okay. How do truth and light relate? Well, because we talk about facts. <laughs> okay. Increases understanding. Increases like, understanding. You see things clearer with light and you can understand things clearer with light. Okay. Bring man out of darkness. Darkness. So... Now, if we keep reading, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now, that word overcome is a complicated word, and so I gave you an extra handout where the good Dr. Raymond Brown walks through the four possible meanings of what is rendered in your translations here, overcome. The darkness cannot grasp or comprehend. And as you can see, uh, readers of the Bible have been trying, have been debating what peculiar aspect of this relationship this word is trying to get at. Or the darkness did not welcome, receive, accept, or appreciate it. Or the darkness was not able to overtake or grasp in a hostile sense. C. Or the, the darkness was not able to master it. So, so what we have in verse 5 is a tiny little word picture about light and darkness. And if you add verse 4 in, you get this question about life. And, and so, well... Part of why, see this is where context is important. If you lived in the ancient world, what light do you have at nighttime? Stars. Stars. Stars don't give much light. The moon gives light. Because if you have a moonless night, uh, it's pretty dark outside. What are your other options for light in the ancient world? Fire. Fire. And now fire, it's pretty much just fire and moon. But now fire you're going to get in different volumes. So you can have a lamp, which was usually a, a little, which is just a little vessel that you would put oil in. And then you'd have a little bit of flame here. And that would give you a little bit of light. If you wanted a little more light, torch. you might go with a torch, which is a stick with some cloth soaked in oil, and that'll give you a little more light. Or you could go with, let's say, a big, a big fire that would give you more light, but not a lot of light at night in the ancient world, especially compared to us today, where... Too much. Yeah, too much. In fact... People will tell you, turn off your computers and your TVs a few hours before you go to bed because it's that that blue light keeps you up because your body is actually very sensitive to all of this stuff. And But in the ancient world, not a lot of light. And so light was a very powerful metaphor. Yep. Um, it, it seems to me that at that time, I think we're talking about Rome dominating the world. And their television was the the, the auditoriums, and uh, the idea I think is that they make them round. The audience sits around it. It's containing a version of the world that's surrounding them, which is hostile, dark, deadly. You take a trip on a road, you might not make it, and so they 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 reached out into the darkness and they grabbed things and they put them into the middle of the light to see what it was. 
Usually this involved that animal against that man, this bad person against those. And so the world lo looked out into the darkness by looking at the auditorium and the crowd was being educated by a controlled inspection of the world around them. And so when you call Jesus the light, okay, so then you can see that there's a word splendiat, that they may be givers of light. And then the Japanese stuff that I've studied for a long time, uh, they, the Japanese picked up on this word splendid. When you said it was a splendid a cut that was just perfect, a sort of samurai cut, it was splendid. And the whole goal was to be splendid. The whole goal was to was to transfix the audience, to just shock their mind with such perfection that they would go silent in that screen. Um, so I think that's what he's aiming at, is he's saying that, that, that we, God came and brought the light and put it right in the middle of all of us and blew us all away and the darkness that will come rushing in to try and smother it and kill it and destroy it couldn't take it. Yeah. Right, right. So I, I love your idea of you know the theater or the amphitheater or the coliseum right. or the stage or the television or the movie creates a tiny little microcosm of life. And that little picture of life then is meant to reshape our mental images of life and, and what we imagine life is and light well Jesus comes and if you're going to have a stage especially if, if you're going to do it at night in the ancient world and now remember I mean this I mean when I'm talking about light at night I mean it's not until the 19th century that you actually get artificial light besides fire really to the 19th century that shows how difficult it is for us to read the Bible because these things don't have the impact on us because we're surrounded by light. But this light, well, if you walk into a dark room, you stumble, you stub your toe, you can't find things, you stumble around in the darkness. Light suddenly, now you know how to navigate. Now you understand where things are. Now you can act in the world, whereas before, if you're acting in the darkness, what? Nobody sees you. You can't even see yourself. If you go into one of these cave tours, they usually turn off all the light in the cave and you begin to realize, wow, this is real darkness. And they tell you that if you take a person and you put them in darkness all the time, what happens to them? They go crazy. Well, why would you go crazy just being in darkness? No feed. Because your, your body is set for all of this information and all of this information from the outside world literally keeps us sane. And actually having other people around us literally keeps us sane. And so if you isolate a person from all other people, they will go insane. And if you take dark, you take light away from a person, they will go insane. This will kill them. It destroys artists too. Creative people, the Soviets learned that they just put them in a box for six months. Yep. They're just destroy them. They'll never create again. No. Nope. They'll never write music or do whatever they do. Now, Jesus is, the darkness does not overcome it. The darkness can't, and you might use all of those. Now, in the, in the course of church history, all of these things were embraced by certain Christian leaders and scholars and communities. The darkness can't understand the light. And if you understand... So you, you turn on a light in a dark room, what happens to the darkness? Away. Even that language goes away. Well, where does it go? How does it go? See, that's the only language we have. But when you sit and you think about it, it's, well, it makes no sense. The, 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 we, 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 we just, we have to use language like this to talk about it. The darkness can't grasp it. 
The darkness won't welcome the light because light destroys darkness. The darkness um, can't overcome light because light destroys darkness. The darkness can't master light. And, and this is what John is using for us to help us understand the power of Jesus and the and what John's experience of Jesus was. And John is saying, this is an experience that is available to you. And you say, wow. And then we're out of time. Because Lily's got to go to Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> The boss will be waiting. So you can just save the main sheet. You don't have to. You can take this other sheet home with you if you want to read it in detail of all the different options of overcome. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, there's still some darkness in us. We still stumble. We 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 still grope. But we believe that, that Jesus is the light of the world and just as darkness can't master or grasp or comprehend or darkness, darkness has no chance against his light. Help us to believe this. Help us to feel this deep down inside of us. Help us to know it and give us your peace. So we ask in the name of Jesus, amen.